everyone. Welcome to the Islamic Society Leading American Muslims weekly class. And I don't see any new names on the list, so I won't say welcome to the new folks. Let me make sure everybody's admitted into the classroom. And uh, I will remind everyone of the mission of this organization, which is to establish Dawah. And let me make Mason the co-host. Okay. Ma'am Sykes, if we can set someone um, up, someone else as a co-host, just in case. I'll do that, Ms. Paula. I was waiting to see. Um... It's late, maybe, or Lisa. Or... Assalamu alaikum, Ma'am Sykes. You can put me if, uh, if you want. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, so let me greet all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's good to be with you again today. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I welcome each and every one of you. Uh, I remind myself and you of the vision of this organization. Uh, and with that, I share that uh, this week I received an invitation to speak at Advent Health in the medical school there. Uh, which I'm looking forward to doing. Uh, they have contracted with me to do a speech about um, the needs of Muslims in the medical field and the inadequacies. So I ask you to pray for me that Allah will give me the best and latest research in that area to speak to them about. Uh, but I do want you to know that we continue to look for opportunities to do dot work, to educate people about the true and peaceful message of Islam to invite people this way and to educate and empower, which is what we're doing this morning, those people who have already come this way. So let me take a minute to thank all of you for your support. Uh, those of you who continue to support us financially, uh, those of you who volunteer late for uploading the classes, Maysoon and Claudette and Naran and Jessica and all the people that work hard to organize the potlucks and things like this. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for your contribution to our organization. We are a family and we do work together to build upon uh, the vision and the mission of this organization. So I would like to ask everyone to continue praying for Sister Ina. Uh, who is waiting to have a heart surgery, please continue to pray for James and Julie um, and for Wahida's son. Uh, Wahida's son is uh, battling with some substance challenges. So we ask you to pray for that family. <clears throat> Let me remind myself and you that February the 1st began the sacred month of Roger. So we are in a sacred month. Remember that the blessings of this month carry greater reward and the sins carry greater punishment. So remember that you have an opportunity to get, it's like a boga, buy one, get one. Uh, with your good deeds in this month, it's also a great time. As you know, it's um, the second month before Ramadan, so it's a great way to begin to elevate yourself to increase in your good deeds and to decrease in your bad deeds. Um, to aban the month before Ramadan will begin in 19 days, March the 4th. So 
We are really, the countdown is on. And I hope that we are sincerely using this time and the awareness of these dates to prepare ourselves to have the best Ramadan that we've ever had, uh, the best Rajab that we've ever had, inshallah. So as we are focusing in this Islamic year on elevating ourselves in ranks as seekers of the divine, we are focusing on the alchemy of happiness, how to transform ourselves. I encourage myself and you to begin looking at spreading, uh, sh shedding, sorry, uh, destructive habits, uh, work on refining your character, and I encourage you to take quiet time to ponder and reflect and to literally write down what it is that you want to work down and look, work on and look at it every single day. Um, also, with uh, 48 days, if you're going to order any prepared meals uh, from either catering companies or you're going to order online, uh, you'll need to start doing that, particularly with the delay in the mail of recent time. Um, I highly encourage you to be ready, to be proactive, um, planning healthy, hearty, moderate meals, uh, enlist for your suhr, whatever it is you need to get it. Get it now. Don't get it in the month of Ramadan. Don't get it the weekend before. Um, and I also like to encourage all my students, it's not a part of the religion, but it will certainly help you in the beginning of your fasting, is to cut back on your caffeine. Uh, the first day of fasting, if you're a person that drinks a lot of caffeine, uh, you may have a, a headache and some people actually end up getting nauseous uh, because of the caffeine. So begin to study, Google, um, Bing it, whatever you want to do, but search and learn about meals that will help you stay hydrated and energized throughout your days of fasting. Um, and that will give you, like I said, energy. Um, if you get this stuff out of the way, it'll give you more time for worship, which is very important. Uh, of course, it is the purpose of our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created men and gents for not except to worship him. Remember, though, that Ramadan is the month of absence. It is not the month of indulgence. So, so many people will buy all of these foods that they don't even eat normally, and they will make up for the physical fasting when the physical fasting ends. So what I want to remind you is that there is the physical fasting is there, and there is the spiritual fasting. When the sun sets, that might be the end of the physical fasting, but it should not be the end of the spiritual fasting. It should be where we are really focused on how to grow, how to really reap the benefits of the fasting. So uh, if you have children, have them make something to decorate your home, perhaps uh, start reading the Quran every day. Perhaps if you have days to make up, now is the time to do it. Don't wait. Make them up on Monday and Thursday, and you can get the double reward, the intention for fasting on Monday and Thursday, and the intention for making up your fast. Start increasing your dhikr, your remembrance of Allah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prepare our hearts, to make them receptive, to illuminate them, to inspire them, to increase us in ill, to increase us in knowledge to increase the thinning man and to elevate our ranks as seekers of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let us arrive at and implement divine truth and reach the highest stages of spiritual intellect. And with that, we will begin the lecture for today. Alhamdulillah ta'ala nasmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'inuhu when I will be there, he means to rule and cousin. Women say the Afi Amani. May Yahti Hilahu Fala Mudella, when he will Fala Hadiya law, what I shall do on law, Ilah, Ilah, what Dahula Sharikala, what I shall do on the Mohammed and Abduhu Rasul. Indeed, all the praise is due to Allah. We seek Allah's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our souls and from our sinful deeds. Whoever Allah as a wajal exalted be Allah, 
guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity but Allah, as a wajal, the one having no partner, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's final slave and messenger. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu taqullaha haqatu kartihi walla tamotunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who have believed, fear Allah as Allah alone should be feared and do not die except as a Muslim in submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal nasu taqu rabbakum aladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjah wa batha minhumu rijalan kathira wa nasa'a wa taqu Allah aladhi tisa'aluna bihi wa arham inna Allah kana alaykum rakibah O people, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women. And fear Allah for whom you demand mutual rights and revere the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever over you, Ar-Raqib, an observer. Ya ayyuhaladina amru taqullah wa kulu kawan sadida yusle lekum malikum wa yafirikum dhanubukum O you who have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. Allah will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you for your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and Allah's messenger has certainly achieved the greatest achievement. I'm about. So last week we began to examine cognitive and rational perception within us. And we also looked at the two ways that they are achieved. So we talked about how rationality is through reason and intuition, the preface, if you will, to gnosis is the learning that we have from direct experience. I like to call that hands-on learning. So we have this learning that goes on in the filing cabinets of the brain, pieces of information that we put up there. And then we have this deeper level of learning that we have from experience. I have a lot of things in my filing cabinet that do not have the meaning to me that the things in my filing cabinet of the brain have that I have actually experienced. And this sort of leads us into looking at another subject matter in Islam, which is called Wahi. Wahi. And Wahi is about how the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates with humans. And one form of Wahi is referred to as inspiration. And I love to play with words, if you know, and when I look at inspiration, I see in spirit action. That's what I see in that word. So when I'm operating as an inspired being, I am inspired by the spirit, the ruh of Islam. I am inspired by that which I was infused with, the light of Allah, the illumination of Allah, that which Allah has communicated to me. It's sort of like sometimes you will meet other people in other faiths and they'll tell you, God told me. Well, God tells everybody. If you read the Quran or a holy book, one of the divine books, then God is telling you stuff. And okay, go grab my headphones, please. Inspiration, which we also receive, which is part of the unseen. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. The guidance from Allah as a wajal comes through the apostles or messengers of Allah, and they bring with them the scripture of Allah or the message. And the, it's important to take a deeper look at this because we know that there are Rasuls and there are Nabis. There are those who received a divine revelation, and then there are those who simply promoted, propagated, and taught those divine revelations, but did not receive them. But both of them were receiving wahi. They were receiving inspiration, information, knowledge that came from God to mankind. 
So in Surah 57, verse 25, we sent before time our apostles with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the balance of Mizan of right and wrong, the criterion for right or wrong, that men and women may stand forth in justice. Without the guidance being implemented from Allah, as we see in the world, there is little justice and little balance. People tend to go into extremes. The basic message of all prophets from Allah and hence of all scriptures they brought is one and the same message from Allah to men. Now, let me explain that yes, there are abrogations. So early Muslims drank and a revelation came that warned them of drinking and they're not to go to their prayers while they were drinking. So then they would drink at night so they'd be sober by the time Fajr came. And then a revelation came that said no more drinking. So when we say that the revelations are from God, we have to have all of it and we have to know those pieces that were abrogated, those pieces that were changed by new revelations. In Surah Al Hadid, chapter 16 and verse 36, and verily we have raised in every nation a messenger proclaiming, serve Allah and shun false gods. This is Tahut, shun the false idols. The Quran mentions, I believe it's 25 prophets by name. Adam, Ali Salam, Noah, or Noah, Ibrahim, Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Isaac, Lut, who's the Yaqub, Yusuf, Joseph, Musa, Moses, Harun, Dawu, David, Suleiman, Solomon, uh, Elias, uh, Eunice, Jonah, Ayub, Zachariah, Yahya was John, Isa was Jesus, Idris was Enoch. Hud, Dul, Kiflu, Ezekiel, Shoaib, some say was Jethro in the Bible. There's a dispute about that. Uh, Salih, Lukban, Dul, Karnain, uh, Uzair, and Muhammad. These are mentioned in the Quran. And of course, this does not mean only these have been God's prophets. The Quran is clear that the number of prophets is much larger and that to each community from among humanity, Allah as a wajal sent a messenger. And the proof of this is in Surah Al Ghafur, Surah 40, verse 78. We did aforetime send apostles before thee. Of them, there are some whose story we have related to thee, and some whose stories we have not related to thee. To every people in Surah Yunus, this is the word Eunice is the name for Jonah. Surah 10, verse 47, to every people was sent an apostle. Now, there is a weak hadith that says 124,000. And sometimes you'll hear this quoted, but this hadith happens to be very weak. But there are many. The Quran mentions the following revelations as well. And the people that follow those were considered dhimis, people of the book. The sheets were the suhut of Ibrahim and Musa, the Torah of Musa, the Psalms, the Zabur of Dawood, the Gospel, the Injil of Isa, Salam, Jesus, the Quran, and Muhammad. And then, of course, the Quran has many names. The kalam of Allah, the speech of Allah, sent down upon the last prophet Muhammad through the angel Jibril in its precise meaning and precise wording, transmitted to us by numerous persons to water, both verbally and in writing. The Quran is inimitable and unique. It is protected by God from corruption. It is the most memorized book in the world today. 
it will always be protected because it is carried in the heart of so many Muslims who have memorized it. The word Quran is derived from the root Qara'a, which has various meanings, such as to recite, to read, etc. Quran itself is a verbal noun and hence means the reading or recitation. As used in the Quran itself, the word refers to the revelation from Allah in the broad sense and is not always restricted to the written form in the shape of a book as we have it before us today. However, it does mean revelation to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alone. For revelation to the other prophets have been referred to by different names, such as the Torah, the Injil, Kitab, etc. The revelation from Allah to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is referred to in the Quran itself by the name Quran, recitation, as well as by other names, the Furqan, the Criterion, in Surah Al Furqan, Surah 25, verse 1. Tanzil means sit down. In Ashura, Surah 26, verse 192, it is referred to in Al Hijr, Surah 15, verse 9, is Dhikr. And it is referred to in Surah Al Anbiya, Surah 21, verse 10, as Kitab. There are other references to the Quran, such as Nur light, Huda, guidance, Rahma, mercy, Majid, glorious, Mubarak, blessed, Bashir, announcement or announcer or tidings, Nadir, warner, etc. All these names reflect one of the various aspects of the revealed word of Allah. And this takes us into that meaning again of Wahi. And the scholars give us eight forms of wahi, and we won't go over them today. But the word wahi or inspiration from Allah comes from the word awha, from which wahi is derived. And it occurs in several shades of meaning in the Quran each of them indicating the main underlying idea of inspiration, directing or guiding someone. The self-reproaching soul reminds you of knowledge that you have of the Quran or a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu recorded and then they become a guide to you. This is proof that cognitive and rational perception can operate without any sensible impressions based on the five senses. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, though much of our learning is what we experience with our five senses, and therefore it is sensible, there is a knowledge out there that doesn't necessarily make sense because it talks about things that we cannot see, things that we cannot hear, things that we cannot touch. But this is the best knowledge to have. This is the knowledge that will be most fruitful in the hereafter. The experience of what that knowledge addresses. So there is learning outside of the five senses. There is learning through internal cognitive deduction and finally, there is inspirational learning. And for all of these, the motivating force is willpower. So I am inspired by the essence of Islam. I study all of the verses that have one particular word in it. And I look for how is it applied in the world at that time. When were these lessons used? And this is referred to as the Asbab an nazul the reason and occasion a revelation. And we look to these reasons and we make comparisons and we are inspired by these stories. And so since that will 
is the final piece of an act, we ask ourselves the question, will it be my will or Allah's will? Now, conscience and willpower are referred to as the practical intellect because it means what we practice. If you think about practical intellect, it is what I practice on a daily basis. And it's manifested by what I will to do and by what's in my conscience. And as the final point in an act, the practical intellect receives and illuminates ideas that come from our mind or our imagination or our heart, and it makes the decision to act. That is the final point. All of this stuff is going on, and then we say, what am I going to do? Because of these dispositions given to us by Allah, we not only have comprehension, but are able to distinguish between constructive and destructive dispositions and arrive at divine truth. We are able through the revelation, through the examples of various prophets to understand what is a constructive disposition and what is a destructive disposition. And then reason is used when our intellect ponders and considers material things and understanding is used to comprehend spiritual truths. So we reason about what we do in the world with material things. And let me warn you that when you see the word reason, that means I can justify, I can intellectualize, I can rationalize why I am doing what I want to do instead of what Allah wants me to do. When reason strives toward contemplation, that is referred to as cognitive intellect. When it seeks the positive and finds that it goes forward to the will in order that we may follow the positive or flee from the negative, that we can perhaps find out something that will protect us or something that might bring us comfort. And then we have to be careful because then am I serving the nafs or am I serving Allah? And then from all of these deliberations, then there is that final act. And that is where life habits are developed. We move from the contemplation, the rationalization, the practicalness, to action. So we say that the practical piece, the practice piece, we say that practical intellect contains active intellect because the practical intellect doesn't just stop with the discovery of information, but goes forward with an action. Anyone can learn and never apply it. But when the learning then has or is followed up by an action, we need to be hypersensitively aware of what that means. And of course, we have to examine with that the role of memory and recall. And I want to pause a minute to talk about memory integration. And I'm looking to see um, who our attendees are today, mashallah. Let me um, remind you that we process and we encode our experiences in layers of memory. The first layer of memory is known as implicit memory. And it begins in the womb. And the majority of researchers say that in the second trimester of birth, we begin to remember sounds. We begin to have awareness and they are being recorded. 
So the first layer implicit memories, we don't make full sense of them because we don't have any practical experience yet. They begin in the womb and they predominate through the early years of life when we do not have a fully developed brain. From our emotions, perceptions, actions, and bodily sensations, we create mental models that shape our expectations about the way the world works. We make decisions not based on Quran or Sunnah, unless we have good parents teaching us. All of this occurs without effort or intention, and our implicit mental models can continue to shape how we act without our awareness. That's why we refer to it as automatic pilot. The puzzle pieces of implicit memory are later assembled into explicit memories, the factual and autobiographical information of which we are aware to know yourself is to know a lot. The more we can shine the light of mind sight on the free floating pieces of the puzzles of our past life, the implicit memories and allow them to become explicit the more we can free ourselves to live fully in the present and have new choices about how we live our lives. Because the choices will be based upon the criterion of life, upon the Quran and the Sunnah. What saves human beings is the natural disposition that Allah has placed in them. It is that self-reproaching soul. This soul is conscious of sin and the misguidance of the ego. It is vigilant about its speech and action, strives to resist all immoderate or harmful influences or temptations. This soul has elevated its ranks from the Nasamara to the Naslawama, from the unconscious soul to the soul that is awake, to the soul that is aware of sin because it is learned and therefore it resists that. And sometimes we have to recognize, not sometimes we always have to recognize that this kind of ilm, this kind of knowledge transcends common sense. And so what does Imam Ghazali say about this? He says, our voluntary motivation contains, in addition to the properties of animal motivation. So animal motivation is when we do not employ fitra. It is that which makes us different from animals. It is the infusion of the ruh of Allah, the fitra that makes us different from animals. We have an instinct to follow Allah. Animals have an instinct to just follow their nature. Our nature was given to us by Allah. And therefore, we should have a godly nature, so to speak. We know we cannot be like God, but we should have that kind of nature because we know Allah so well and we know Allah's attributes and therefore we implement them no matter what. Our voluntary motivation contains in addition to the properties of animal motivation, free will. When an animal is in heat, the animal cannot resist. They will cry and make noises like you can't believe because they are driven the way that Allah created them. As a matter of fact, we have to put animals when they're in heat in pins because we know that they cannot control themselves. They don't have that will. And this will, my beloved brothers and sisters, I want you to frame it like this. However you have felt about will before, I want you to erase that and adopt this. That free will is the highest form of motivation. I have choice. So many people today will say, I don't have any choices. We have so many choices. Allah has given us so many choices. It is the highest form of motivation in nature's mode of operation and is independent of conscious or reason. When you love Allah, it is not about rationalizing while I do it. It's not about intellectualizing why I do something. 
it is simply because I love Allah and that fitra within me, that infusion of Allah within me makes me, reminds me, drives me, inspires me to that if I am awake, if I am listening. It may do as it pleases, but our spiritual heart will be responsible regardless in the hereafter for our intentions or motivations, in other words, for the choices we make. Now, let me add to that, that the beauty of Islam is that we are not responsible if we are ignorant, but then we are not supposed to remain ignorant. We are told to study, to learn, to seek knowledge. And the best of all knowledge is the knowledge of Allah. The cognitive system is the control center for thought and action and our conscious free will and the ability to gain consciousness of ourself. Allah has equipped us. He didn't just say to know yourself is to know Allah. He's given us the capacity to know ourselves and to change. Allah doesn't change the conditions of a man or woman until they change what is within themselves. Remember to know yourself is to know Allah. The norm in traditional psychology in Islam is for the cognitive system to regulate the preconscious. Not to the extent that it can come to know, but to the extent that it can be disciplined. We must learn to love discipline. The Prophet ﷺ loved consistency in acts of worship. And it takes discipline to develop consistent habits. To know yourself is to know Allah. The norm in traditional or Islamic psychology is for cognitive system to regulate the preconscious. Behavioral and unconscious affective natural dispositions known as fitra. By keeping them in a state of equilibrium or moderation in terms of the straight path. So if I am wanting to know what to do, if I defer, if I am confused about something, if I look to the Quran and the Sunnah, I will have the right answer that will keep me in balance, that will give me equilibrium. And when I'm at equilibrium, I'm not insecure. I'm secure, I'm confident, I'm safe. We see here that practical intellect is about what we practice. It is a manifestation of our conscious and free will. It is through our practical intellect that we love or hate, live in society and have friends and positive disposition. The practical intellect is the locus of the highest form of perception and motivation. The highest form of nature in its mode of operation in the perceptive system within the self is the conscience which is the source of the general principles upon which morality is based. The highest form of nature in its mode of operation, and obviously when I say that, it is a fancy way for saying in the fitra, is the voluntary and motivational system is choice or free will. It receives sensible, and cognitive stimuli from the external and internal senses. When the stimuli are purely sensible, five senses based, they have been first passed from the senses to the attraction to pleasure or avoidance to harm system, and from there to the practical intellect where a response is given. What am I going to do? When the stimuli are purely cognitive, they pass directly into the practical intellect for action. When the stimuli are both sensible and cognitive, the practical intellect is the locus of operation for deliberation and the production of some action, including human arts and sciences. The practical intellect contains the cognitive intellect and the latter develops in four stages. 
There are four stages in the acquiring of the cognitive intellect, which is held in preparedness within the practical intellect. That was through practice. And each one of these is called an intellect. Once the practical intellect acquires these intellects by completing the perfection of nature and its mode of operation within the self, that is when the self is centered, the practical intellect then operates through the active intellect. And the four stages that Imam Ghazali refers to as potential, habitual, active, and acquired intellects. What will we acquire? What will we, how will we be active? What will our habits be and what is potential? And let me speak to, if I may, potential and what Allah has said about potential. Potential means having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. It usually refers to latent qualities or abilities that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equipped us with fitra. He equipped us with this quality, this ability to be connected to Allah. And what is the reward for that in this bliss in paradise? Eternal life of happiness. So this true potential of Muslims is revealed in the Holy Quran. In Surah Al-Anfal, Surah 8, verse 65. O Prophet, motivate the believers to fight. If there are 20 steadfast among you, they will overcome 200. Listen, my brothers and sisters, do the math. If there are 20 believers, they will overcome 200 who do not believe. Listen to the verse. And if there are 100 of you, they will overcome 1,000 of the disbelievers. For they are a people, the disbelievers who do not comprehend. They understand not. Forget about fighting. Just focus on the potential. It's the month of Rajab. We cannot fight in the month of Rajab unless we are attacked. The following verse, verse 66 in Surah Al Anfal, chapter 8. Now Allah has lightened your burden. For he knows that there is a weakness in you. So if there are a hundred steadfast among you, they will overcome 200. And if there be 1,000, they will overcome 2,000 by Allah's will. And Allah is with the steadfast. You see, if Allah is for you, who can be against you? No one. The ratio in the first verse is 1 to 10. In the second, it's 1 to 2. When all of the things are equal, a believer can be twice to 10 times better than a disbeliever. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that they, the ones who disbelieve, are a people who do not comprehend what is it that the believer comprehends that the believer does not? You see, the disbeliever, the disbelievers don't believe in the hereafter. So they hold on to their life on earth. And they retire, rely entirely on their own preparation and their own strength. And they believe that whatever they do is from themselves. The Muslim knows there is no movement, there is no might except Allah as a wajah. On the other hand, life on earth is just a passage for believers. It's the marathon testing ground. They get rewarded no matter the outcome of the battle. Plus their reliance to wackle 
is not only on their preparation and strength, but it is upon their owner, their Lord, their Rab, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The condition to unlock this potential, my beloved brothers and sisters, is to be steadfast. Steadfast and unmovable in your prayers. Steadfast and unmovable in your fasting. Steadfast and unmovable in your dhikr. Steadfast and unmovable when you pay the cost. And what makes the balance shift in favor of the believers is the power of faith, the power of demand. So I asked myself and you the question, how can we apply this teaching in our daily life and hope to unlock a similar potential? And I say to you, my beloved brothers and sisters, that there are two types of work that we need to do. We need to catch up on others that have this similar knowledge and we need to strengthen our faith. Allah as a Wajal has given us, according to a week of 124,000 messengers, but 25 from the Quran. Imagine Muslims showing up to the battlefield today with wooden sticks. No matter how much their faith, they would lose. And this is a problem because oftentimes new converts will find the most rigid follower of Islam. One, if it says that they rode camels, they don't drive cars, they would just have a camel will rock up at a Fortune 500 camel, Fortune 500 job and with your camel and see how long you keep the job. See what they do when you arrive at the parking lot. So Allah gave us wisdom and hikmah. Even the prophet in battles hired non-Muslim engineers to help, to know what to do. Didn't limit in knowledge to just the most rigid, strict believer. For winning, it is better to have the same equipment. The same principle allowed Islamic civilization to flourish. The golden age started with a massive movement of translation. The great scholars of Islam studied other civilizations. They studied what they had and how they did things. And by doing so, did, they did not only catch up with the rest of the world, but they surpassed the world in medicine and many of the sciences. And what has happened to us today, that has ceased. And let me speak a moment to that second part. And the second part is about strengthening our faith. The reason that I teach and maybe it sounds repetitive sometimes, is because I know that this kind of knowledge will strengthen your faith. Faith, that steadfast practice will strengthen your faith. And I am not talking, my beloved brothers and sisters, about rituals and obligations and prohibitions. I am talking about knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we know that in the authentic hadith, it says that we will find Allah the way we know Allah. And so I need to know a lot about Allah. I need to know what the Quran says. I need to know the asma wa safat, the names and the attributes of Allah. No one can know Allah entirely. But even if we know 1% more than yesterday, we can transform our lives. But we must be reminded, we must be steadfast in reminding ourselves that Allah is merciful, that Allah is compassionate, that Allah is watching over us, that Allah is our sustainer, that Allah is our protector, that Allah, the all-wise, has the best plan for us. If we learn one more thing about Allah every day of our life, just one more, 
It will light up our hearts and it will also expand our minds. You would be surprised how many Muslims have misconceptions about Allah, how Allah distributes subsistence, how do our works and what is the real meaning of relying on Allah as a wajah? Some will spend a lifetime praying to a God that they know so little about, to the God that they know so little about. By doing so, we never get to taste the sweetness of faith, build the resilience to go through adversity or unlock a potential available to us. No saviors are going to come and fix everything in the Muslim community. I believe in the silent and steady effort of developing ourselves over time. With the internet, Muslims have access to the same resources as anyone else. Whatever the field we are interested in, we can find someone to learn from. Some contents are free, others we have to pay for, and this is normal. Acquiring knowledge, my beloved brothers and sisters, is an investment in time, money, or both. The companions weren't the only ones capable of showing extraordinary potential. Remember what Allah has said about you, that you were created in the best of molds, the best of people evolved. At the first stage of potential intellect, the self thinks nothing but is prepared to think. Here, the intellect cannot be created in the act of knowledge. It is simply receptive to it. If there is actual knowledge at this stage, we will not understand the reality of it. Out of this, through reminders, grows the habitual intellect. Here, the possibility of actualizing, materializing, the potentials, intellects, preparedness exist. Here, the possibility of actualizing the potential intellects, preparedness exists. This means knowing the principles or axioms of knowledge like the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Inshallah. Next week, I will begin to talk about the active intellect. But we'll stop here today focusing on, inshallah, how we will think and how we will practice and what will our habits be. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu Allah ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Transcended are you, O Allah. And praise be to you as you praise yourself. I bear witness that there is no deity except you, Allah. I seek your forgiveness and I repent to you. Amin. So I will now open up the uh, mic and encourage uh, class members to share what they are learning, what it's doing for you, how it's affecting you, how it is increasing you in your iman, inshallah. And so I will look at the chat just to see if there's something there that, okay, mashallah, jazakallah, jazakallah, khair. Um, who would like to share? Salam alaikum, Imam Sykes, it's Doug. How are you? The khair, alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, amazing class as usual. I'm, I'll, I'm, I may share a little more later um, on just the content of the class itself. However, uh, before I forget, can you share the date and time and location of the Advent Health uh, talk you'll be giving? I will do that. Um, I'll have Naran send it out. It will not be open to the public. It's only open for physicians actually in residency. I will be speaking to the residency program. Um, but uh, I, will, I will find out if we can record that. And if so, I will absolutely share it with the family. But um, this is uh, 
a paid speech uh, that I will be doing. Obviously, all the money goes to the organization. And I ask yes. you to pray that okay. Allah, will, Allah will enhance me in knowledge. And uh, what I will do is I will ask the coordinator if um, I can invite a few people. I'll, I'll do that. Well, uh, Mika was really, uh, you know, being an employee of Advent Health, she, maybe she can pull some strings and sneak in the back row anyway, but um, 